tell you 10, 20, and 30. Our speaker today has been a Toastmaster for 10 years. I've seen him do trainings for executives, extremely informative, educational, and funny. He has, as his high performance, started a podcast, and to this date, he's done over 20 shows. If you have not seen TDK talk, take a look at it. Extremely informative and will help your club. And Terry has over 30 years of experience in the tech world. Today he's gonna to share his experience to inspire us for personal growth and in giving back. With, but will they keep me? The dawn of entrepreneurship. Please help me welcome Terry Koster. It should work out quite well. Again, thanks for coming. I was really looking forward to putting this, this presentation together. But I did so under two apprehensions. One apprehension was Will the educational committee select me? Because I know their standards can be high. And I thought, well, no big deal. I'll just put it together, I'll submit it, and they might not even pick me. But lo and behold, as a true testament to my two references, they did select me. So I'm really looking forward to presenting it here today. My second apprehension then was, do I have enough time? It was about six, seven weeks prior and I was wondering, do I have enough time to put everything together that I want into a 30-minute presentation? But I think I've achieved that. Now, when I was giving this presentation as a practice session in shortened form to two of my clubs, one of the feedback that I got from a member was, don't go up against PowerPoint, because PowerPoint will win. <laughs> <laughs> but I decided to throw in a few extra slides anyways against their better judgment. So probably I can look at this group and divide the room up into three groups. You know, there's gonna be the group that's gonna say, okay, I haven't heard uh, uh, the term entrepreneurship anymore, I'm all ears, what's it all about? There's gonna be the second camp that's probably gonna say, hey, what's the big deal? I know all about it, I've been practicing it for several years now. And of course, there's the third group that says, oh shit, I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> so that's scramble for the door. So if, if I see a few people do that, no big problem. Entrepreneurship, what is it to be an entrepreneur? Is it calling you? Now I'm going to refer to several of my past work histories, but that's just the base. It's not about me. It's about each and every one of you. I'd like to talk to you a bit about entrepreneurship and what it is to be an entrepreneur. In hindsight, really, I realized that I've been preparing for this session for uh, 33 years now. And I'll get to that eventually, soon enough. I've been preparing for 33 years, so I thought, what six weeks? That's no problem. <laughs> remember, remember when all of us graduated <laughs> from college, university, some post-secondary education? We wanted to get out there and just save the world. We were so full of confidence. We, we learned so much new and interesting uh, theories and, and practice. We just wanted to get out there and do wonderful things. Remember that? Well, last June 22nd, I had the misfortune, eventually fortune, of being laid off. And I lost my job, June 22nd of last year. And I was out of work for about eight months. So that gave me a chance to reflect a little bit. It gave me a chance to reflect. So, again, you lose your job, what do you do? You take another resume workshop, and you say, my goodness, how many more resume workshops can I take? So that got me to produce a version two, a version three, a version five, version eight, 10. I think at the end of six or seven months, I was at 15 versions of a resume. 15 versions. And as much as it was better and improved, I looked at it and I sat down and I felt dejected and I said, this resume undersells me. There's so much to put in there, but yet a person can't do it. What am I gonna do? So as much as it was approved, I decided to create a master resume, a resume that only I will see. It has every job on there that I've ever done in order to reflect and see where I've come from and where I'm hopefully heading to. Now that's a little bit scary because I realize that I've had 15 jobs in 22 years. That's 2.2 years per job. My shortest, 
it was three months, my longest was six and a half years. Three of them were transition jobs. And about nine weeks ago, I landed my 16th job. So what's the lesson here? Don't ask Terry for advice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make my software and whatever you do, do not, do not work where I'm wrong. People have said I'm the kiss of death. <laughs> 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 And luckily, I took it with some humor <laughs> after I got another job. <laughs> so my background, I'm an electronics technologist. I've been working in high tech for <coughs> most of those 33 years, except for a few months or so when I was unemployed and doing stuff like this. <laughs> and I reflected on the very first job I had in Winnipeg in 1979 in my profession as a technologist. And it was at a telecommunications plant and a manufacturing plant and there was about 40, 50 of us technicians that covered two shifts, day and an evening shift, and we were working at a test bench, aligning brand new telecommunications modules and equipment. And I reflected on it, and I realized that was a really good team environment. We've all heard of that word team, working together as a team. And I wonder, why did it go <coughs> so well? Why did we all meld 50 people? We all work so well. And I realized that, uh, well, number one, we were all the same age. We had the same educational background. We all knew each other's pay, because everybody came in starting at the same rate of pay. Every six months, we knew what our raise was going to be. And after about three years, we were all at the top rate of, of pay, and we knew what it was. We all helped each other out. We went out for lunch once in a while, and even in the evening shift, we went out for a beer or two and laugh about our day shift. We got all along quite well. It was true teamwork. But lo and behold, that was probably my last true environment of teamwork because everything since then hasn't been quite the same. You see, during those first five to eight years that I was working, we knew that we were entering the uh, information age. We were the knowledge workers, like many of you, right? It's, it's stuff we knew, it's not so much, uh, or not always, what we were able to do. So in those five to eight years, I always took an evening class. I, whether it was technical, there was even some soft skills, because we knew or felt that, that the more we knew, uh, extra over and above what we studied at, that would help us perhaps uh, get a better job, perhaps keep a job, make us more valuable. And the question at the back of my mind always was, if push comes to shove, <coughs> the economy and the company's in a tough spot, will they keep me? Will they keep me? Well, of course not, because I've proven that. Of course they <laughs> Of course they will. And the way people work now in companies is they try and set themselves up as linchpins, as key people, so that if, uh, if a company comes to push, push or shove, they have to make some adjustments, they will try and keep those key people. And Seth Godin wrote a good book a couple years ago that I read from front to back. I highly recommend it. Linchpin. Are you the linchpin at your work? Are you the key person? So I kind of started to think, and what really changed over the last 30 years that I've seen in my work career? What has really changed? Well, commendations are few to none. Our guest speaker this morning spoke of that. We, we don't give enough uh, uh, encouragement to people. We don't give enough commendations to one another. As Toastmasters, we do. That's one of the big soft skills that we learn how to do. But in the working world, commendations I found are few to none. Uh, it seems like companies don't really have a three to five year business plan anymore. There's been a loss of teamwork. Uh, there's been a lot more job instability. There's no loyalty to the employee from the company. Job timelines have gotten shorter. And collaboration at work is getting thinner, even sometimes extinct, I found. Now some of you may, may have seen similar. This is what I have uh, found in my past uh, 33 years. And what's that created with employees is uh, suspicion, uncertainty, and a loss of identity. An employee doesn't really know where they stand with the company. They don't know how valuable they are. They don't know whether the company would keep them. Does the company value them? And it's, it's caused them to lose some of their identity. And for people who relate, uh, relate their own personal identity to their jobs, solely their jobs, that's devastating because it, it leaves them lost. It leaves them lost. And that's what's been happening, I felt. <coughs> and over my 32 years of work, the work paradigm has changed slightly. I found it's 
broken down into two equal parts, basically. The people at the top are driven by money, and the people at the bottom are driven by fear. The fear of losing their jobs. And we've all heard these comments over the last 10, 20 years, for example. You should be happy to have a job. If you don't do it, move over. Someone else will. And you want holidays yet? <laughs> and my favorite one, this one, this one may see us to eternity. Emails. You ever notice that when there's a bad email to go, uh, going out, it's an uh, it's, uh, email to you, but it's CC to the whole world, <laughs> short of the Pope? <laughs> but if you come up with a solution and fix something, you know what? Thank you only goes to you. No one else sees it. So consequently, everyone on the distribution list only sees the negative about you, but they never see the positive. And that, that's allowed to proliferate almost all the time. There was uh, one company that I worked for quite recently. It was quite interesting because the projects that uh, I worked on uh, there were roughly nine months to 12 months in duration. I was never involved in the kickoff meeting. So I didn't know the big picture of where this product was going. I didn't know what the timeline was. I didn't know who's driving it. I didn't have any of that, which is OK. That's fine. But nine to 12 months later, when it's wrapping up, and that's where you're going to see some hiccups, because there are. They're unforeseen. That's when you are included. <laughs> and I found, yeah, when it's, it seems like when there's the, just the good stuff, it's limited to a few core people, like linchpins, right? The linchpins. But when things are wrapping up and there's a good chance that something's going to go awry and uh, off course, now all of a sudden you're included in everyone else. Seems like they want to distribute that base over <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> and that just wasn't one project. I thought maybe a bad day, bad project, different project manager. That kept happening over and over over the last uh, five years or so. So it was kind of humorous in a way. But eventually, and I don't know when this was, eventually, and it's like the clouds part. You can see forever. The sun shines through. And you realize, why didn't I see this before? You realize, after a certain amount of time, <laughs> you say, screw the world. <laughs> you realize the world doesn't want to be saved. <laughs> and you say to yourself, geez, I just got to save myself. <laughs> And you figure, why did it take me so long to see this? Why did it take so long? See, quite honestly, the world's got bigger things to worry about. The world isn't worried about uh, Terry's aspirations at work, or Keith's, or Christina's, correct? And, and then each one of you. It's not. But all this culminates, and it leads to something very interesting. As, as how the famous IBM computer in that 70s sci-fi 2001, a space odyssey, so he gave, and he kept saying it several times, I believe, something wonderful is going to happen. Something wonderful. You see, we're now at an age where we as individuals have far more tools at our disposal that are virtually free and very inexpensive, very affordable. For one thing, we have very uh, high-speed internet that's inexpensive. We have the capability of blog tools. You can create your own blog or website for next to nothing, sometimes for free. We have a very high standard of living in North America. And as Toastmasters, we're very resourceful. We know that. We're highly educated. And the thing that I found out, and I don't know, again, where, where the switch occurred in my last 10 years, whenever I was looking for a new job, now the number one criteria that I was looking for, I was looking for the team environment. I wanted to see how are they and their teams? Are they a team company? A lot of companies say they are. They still use it as a buzzword. But when you go in there, and probably after your six or one year probation part, you realize uh, that was just paying lip service. You know, it's not something that you can just be handed. You got to feel. You have to feel like you're part of a team. And not just one day or one week or one month, but over through the months you're there, you have to feel like you're part of a team. And I realized that we people, that's what we want. We want to be part of a team. We want to be put in a position where we are contributing. And we want to feel like we're <coughs> being appreciated for what we contribute, or at least listen to. So I kind of arrive here thinking, well, is this entrepreneurship really all that new? Because 
Some of the people that I grew up with in my town, they were post-World War II European settlers who probably had no more than grade six education. They would have three, four, five different skills that they survived on, and they helped each other out. Many times it was no money involved, just an exchange of services. So I think now it's just becoming more and more visible. And there's a good book about this, Karma Queens, Eat Gods, and Inner Pairs, mm -hmm. written by Ron Rentel. Just came out a few years ago. Don't be alarmed with its size. The chapter on Inner Pairs is only 28 pages in the middle of the book. And that's the 28 pages that is good reading by this book. So dawn of the interpreneur, we've arrived at, that, uh, arrived at that point probably in the last several years. This word interpreneur, interpreneurship, it's not even in the dictionary yet. If you search for it, you'll probably see phrases like creative class, creative capitalism, or cultural creative. It means much the same thing. Now an entrepreneur, define, basically entrepreneurs use their facets to find personal fulfillment and growth, creatively, spiritually, emotionally, and there's a the big one, and create social change. They create something, whatever their passion is, they find a way of giving it back to other people. And we as Toastmasters are learning that all the time because it's a lot of what our membership and our clubs are based on is helping each other out. And the higher you climb, the more you want to give back to junior Toastmasters. It's not entrepreneur, it's innerpreneur, inner, pointing towards your inner self. So this is what the entrepreneurship is all about. And what are some of the other traits of entrepreneurs? Well, very much the same as us Toastmasters. We have a high need for achievement and independence, we have a low need for conformity. There's too much conformity for us as it is. It restricts our growth. Internal locus of control. We control it. A love of ambiguity. We keep ourselves open. This love of ambiguity is much the same as uh, what we're uh, encouraged when we do our speeches. Think out of the box. Get yourself out of your comfort zone. Go speak to other groups outside your club. Challenge yourself. We have a propensity for risk taking because we take chances with something new. We don't know how it's going to work out. And we have an obsession with opportunity. Again, our breakfast keynote speaker this morning said we have to be cognizant of opportunities that can appear sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, and to take advantage of that and try and put ourselves in a position to use those opportunities. It's total out of the box thinking. And if you're not convinced that entrepreneurship is taking hold over the last couple of years and growing, walk down your literary aisle at your, at your grocery store where I found just these books, or, or go through Kohl's, or your favorite bookstore, The Secret. That book was out a few years ago already. The Awakening Course by Joe Vitale. The Purpose Driven. Purpose Driven Life. Sorry? Purpose Driven Life. The Purpose Driven Life, yes. Did I miss that? The Purpose Driven Life. Sorry. The Twelfth Insight. Start late, finish rich. <laughs> the leader who had no title. The monk who sold his Ferrari. The tipping point. How little things can make a big difference. And outliers, the story of success. This isn't all of them. There's a lot more, I'm sure. But these are just some of the ones I've seen side by side. And I realize that these books are a little bit different from those management guru books that we've been exposed to in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s. They're a little bit different. Well, remember Good to Great by Jim Collins? This is a fabulous book. It came out a couple years ago, maybe about four or five years ago. How companies can go from good to great. His theory was that companies have enough skill and talent to get up to a good level, and then they stop rather than moving forward and keep working at it to become great companies, they stop. And also this one by Stephen Colby, the seven highly, the, hab the seven habits of highly effective people. This one's come out in many languages in many countries. Also, very good book. But the problem with those two books, and, and it's not just those two, but all the other management's books, these are dealing with issues outside of us that we may have little control over. 
there are outside factors within the company, within the culture, uh, outside of you. And that's good to know. The other big problem with those books is they'll dump a lot of information on you. You'll be inspired, but there's nowhere in those books where it tells you how to incorporate that back into yourself. It's sort of left up in the middle, and they become eventually doorstops and collect dust, perhaps. <laughs> so that's what happens to those. And you know, you've heard of all the other great books, how to get rich overnight, how to make a gazillion dollars in one day, how to be a better manager, etc. There's been tons of those books around. So it's so much so that, that a famous one was written that everybody relies on for their daily chuckle by Scott Adams, Dilbert, the Dilbert <laughs> Principle. This is a fabulous read because we can all relate to many of those comics in that, in that book. But I realized there's one problem with that book. And basically, it's a defeatist attitude. It's succumbing. It's having you succumb to the things you cannot change at work. It's giving in. It's accepting what's there, for example, that you can't change things at work with your manager or, or working on your project, the hiccups. So it's just, just accept it and laugh about it. And that's too bad because we can take it much further than that and, and, and grow ourselves by getting around that. I think if I wrote a book, I'd have a title already picked out. I don't know how that's going to sell, but I call it something like 101 Reasons Why You Should Buy This Book. These are really good books, but there's a lot of other ones that are just copies. They're saying much the same thing, but in different words. So, but I realized that what's happened in the 33 years, for example, that it took my father to finish his one job when he retired, 33 years, What's happening now is people are working anywhere from two to five years, on average. Could be four, could be seven. And they're changing jobs for a variety of reasons. So to make up one 35-year working career stint, now many of us are going to do several different jobs. Maybe not as many as me, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, they're doing it in blocks, in blocks of two to five years. And I just put five, for example, as an average. And our expectations as people, I think, are getting higher. We're expecting uh, more sometimes from the companies that we're going to work for. But also, I think we're uh, having higher expectations of ourselves, of our own growth, of our own capabilities. It was so much so that in the 70s or 80s, I think, I came across this book. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a tutorial for managers by a consulting company High velocity culture change, how managers at companies can adapt to the fast pace world of business and how to transform their teams to keep up, you know, to keep up with that. Quite a good book. And several weeks ago in the Technology Review magazine, there's a, a graph here showing that uh, in 2000, with websites, in 2000, we would wait, as uh, internet users, we would wait up to eight seconds for a website to come up on screen before we navigate it away, thinking it was locked up. By 2009, uh, 10 years later, it's dropped down to three seconds. It's come down to a third. So that shows how much more impatient we are as people. <laughs> Waiting for a website in Google Analytics will tell you that, that when you're a website owner, uh, the amount of time people spend on your website, it's huge, counted down to the seconds. So that's what's been happening. My father worked for 33 years. He retired. I'm at 33 years, got my 16th job, and now I feel like I've just entered my half-life. I feel like a radioactive substance. <laughs> Locked up summers in quarantine, I don't know. <laughs> and it got so bad, thankfully, that one author, Carl Honor, several years ago, wrote a really good book called In Praise of Slow. He's leading a worldwide movement telling all of us how to slow things down and enjoy things. Everything from, from food, from, uh, from, from tasting wine and fine beverages, driving to work, spending quality weekends. He's leading a worldwide movement encouraging people to slow down and learn how to enjoy life. He even talks about sex, slowing down sex. Now, who, 
Who figured that the human race would speed up even that? <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So again, entrepreneur characteristics. You, Toastmasters, very, very similar. Believe that you should do what you are, what you love, that you see a different world. You let your values, your passion, guide your life. You have an innate need to be creative. You want to pick a unique path that's good for you. You want to make things different. You're attracted to improving the world. And you will alternate your career focus with periods of reflection. That uh, could be maybe a long weekend. You do something totally different. You, uh, you volunteer for s some cause that makes you feel really good. You could even take something uh, during your holidays and make a trip and uh, do something quality, do some charity work with some other groups, or even in between jobs. If you have a lapse of work for s several months, you put some time towards a volunteer group, for example. That's what helps develop our entrepreneurial talents for each and every one of us. It's totally teaching us how to take our skill set out, out, out of our comfort zone to challenge ourselves. Now, the other thing about about the entrepreneurship, the one main difference between entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs is money. Entrepreneur is solely focused on eventually making money. Not so with the entrepreneur. Entrepreneur's total focus is uh, inner growth, inner growth and satisfaction, finding your passion and following that. And if anything, I say, yes, we need entrepreneurs. Nothing wrong with being an entrepreneur. But I think each and every one of us should start with being an entrepreneur first. And you probably heard that several times from other avenues where people are encouraging you to find your passion, do what you love, and the money will follow. That's the stepping stone. And in fact, it may come to a time you get so caught up in your entrepreneurship, you may have to have a loved one or a good friend smack you on the head <laughs> and say to you, hey, do you realize that you have a product or service here that someone is willing to pay for? And as such, then you could do that. You could take it out and you can charge some money and then you can become an entrepreneur. But at the core, I think you're still an entrepreneur. You're dynamic, you keep your eyes open for new opportunities, you're cognizant of changes that are around you in society. <coughs> It got to the point where I, I bought this book just in the last year, The Rules of Work. I think I found it at Costco. And I bought it simply because I thought it would be a totally humorous read, much the same <laughs> as the Dilbert Principle. But lo and behold, 108 rules in that book, I've read as far as Rule 88, it's quite serious. Each rule is a page to a page and a half long. And I found that most of those rules I found are true at work. It's <laughs> given very concisely and succinctly in one, one and a half pages. So we have these rules of work now, right? And we've had rules of work since we started any job. Now, we do need rules at work. We can't get around that. But I realize that the, the problem is there's too many rules at work. Those rules stump our personal growth. And I've seen this again happen where if you try and bring out, if you try and practice some of your entrepreneurial skills at work with a manager or two and coworkers, you will be seen perhaps as being uh, too aggressive, you will be seen as nonconformist, you will be seen as trying to buck the system, uh, going against the flow, and all you're doing is looking for your own personal growth. That's the problem with, with doing that at work. And the number one reason, I think, why people change jobs is because they feel they've plateaued at their skill level at work, and they don't get any more new challenges. Their personal growth is stumped. So they graduate by looking for other jobs. They quit and they go to another job because they want to keep that inner growth continuing and growing. That's the problem with trying to become an entrepreneur totally at work. So entrepreneurship, it allows the person to develop with their rules and timelines. Now, if you still don't believe it, here's one site that I rely on totally. It's uh, by a uh, marketing gal from Toronto. She's a marketing and communications guru. Her website, Elastic Mind, marketing and communication design. Her tagline is rise of the entrepreneur. 
cultivate the business within, within you. And I read through a good number of it, and, and, and she goes back and forth from doing her own entrepreneurial uh, skill by posting blogs and ideas to this website, to also interviewing other entrepreneurs at what they're doing with their jobs. It's very good. I rely on it totally. I was lucky enough to interview her for sh my show number 18. I did want her to design my website for me because I, I loved how she did hers. She graciously turned me down, <laughs> but she did agree to do a podcast interview, uh, and I interviewed her for about 15 minutes on show number 18, and as soon as I'm done this, maybe in the next month, I want to interview her again because I found out a lot more new things about entrepreneurship. And uh, this one, stevepivlina.com, it's another entrepreneur's gold mine of resources. If you go through this website, it'll help you determine what your passion is, what kind of talents you may have, how to work towards it. And there's a third one that's also similar, live out your dreams, go beyond the obstacles. This is one by this gal, I forget her name, go beyond the obstacles <coughs> and develop your entrepreneurial skills. Stacy. And here's one that I just heard about uh, three weeks ago. I think he's nearing the end of his run. Dean Carnazes, he's a long distance runner in the States. He's running across the States in something like 75 days. He's nearing uh, Pennsylvania, now the end. He runs every day, 3,000 miles, about 75 days. All the money he raises from this goes to Action for Healthy Kids. His main message and purpose there is to promote better healthy uh, better health and living in the U.S. by kids and adults and try and counter obesity. And Canada, we're not that far behind. We can take a lesson from this gentleman here. Not convinced, here are some local Toastmasters entrepreneurial websites. Mona Cooley, some of you may remember her. She was our District 42 governor about five years ago. She has a website and an entrepreneurial biz called Cool Family Solutions. It's a site and a business she does that helps families deal with mental challenges within their families. When we were kids, mental illness was always kidded about as something you didn't talk about, it was taboo. But it's a mental challenge and it can be overcome. She takes her personal and family experience of 10 years and she turns this to help other families cope with the same kind of issues. Karen Matthews from Calgary, another notable Toastmaster. She has the personal passion blog. She's f facilitated many one-hour workshops on helping people find what their passion is and how to narrow down their many interests down to maybe the top three or four. So she regularly posts probably once or twice a week as well. And this website, because I'm area governor, one of my Area 46 websites, literally speaking, has one member, Laverne Biscay. This is her website, No Ordinary Journey. I went to one of their club meetings because it's like a 15 minute walk from my place uh, Tuesday afternoons when I wasn't working. And I heard Laverne speak. She was delivering a speech from the CC manual. And uh, I just met her. I, I didn't know more about her, but I, I heard her speak and I realized this lady's not here just to get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> She had a purpose and a mission in her speech. She's a motivational speaker. That's her website. Her and her family have spent countless number of trips to many provinces in Africa doing humanitarian aid work, and they still continue to do that. In fact, she came back from Africa on Easter weekend, last weekend. She was there for three weeks uh, doing humanitarian aid work to several provinces. She's also a Rotarian, and she's a professional speaker. She's a member of CAPS as well. That's her interference. And of course, there's mine. There's my website. Originally, I got tired of people saying I have some kind of accent. So I thought, <laughs> if I start recording people and interviewing them, it'll help me curb my whatever this accent people say they hear. So I put that together, and I've been uh, having fun interviewing different people. So my question to all of you is, what is your entrepreneurship? What is it? What is your passion? It's very much the same as the Toastmastering we do, the skills we learn as Toastmasters. And entrepreneurship, its time has come. It's, it's around us. It's a thing we, we have to work towards. 
it really helps us to develop our own skill levels. And it's something we should, we should keep in mind, to be cognizant of those. Now today I received my, my DTM award. And on April 20th, it was exactly, again, there's that number, 20th. That's when I officially got my DTM. And I realized, you know, when we start as Toastmasters, we start on their CC track, the first, the first set of 10 speeches. And when you get your CC award, you realize, OK, that's just one step. So then you go on and you start tackling your advanced communicator manual speeches, the bronze, the silver, and the gold. And you, each time you finish one of those set of 10 speeches, the words, OK, what now? OK, that's another step. Now you're on another step as well. And then you do your high performance leadership project. Then you do uh, you serve as a district or club area division or district leader, and you get your credit for that. And eventually you get your DTM. And I started to think, well, what now? It's just another step done. What now? Well, you just keep moving on. You just keep moving on. So my message to everyone is, is about you. This is about you. This is your chance to start recognizing what your passions are. What are your entrepreneurial talents? I'm encouraging all of you to catch your wave, to place yourself in the forefront of the wave so that you don't become the undertow <laughs> in the economy. Thank you for coming. Uh, at the conference today. Terry, thank you very much. I think this is a really valuable lesson. A very va we hear a lot of different ways of this saying, but I think one, you inspire us, and two, you give us the courage. Because everybody here is getting up for a reason. We all have a message. And if you don't find your audience, then your message goes nowhere. And I, I agree with you. There are people at work who are intimidated or stifled by those who want to make the world a better place because you make them look worse. <coughs> This is valuable information and good inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you, Christine. I also have a one-page handout that has all the books on there that I talked about and websites. So take that with you. If you're interested in me emailing you the e-file version, which has the hot links, leave me your email address.